Hey, Chandler Rolt here, and joining me today is a man that needs no introduction, but I'm going to give him one anyway. <laughs> uh, Mr. Stephen Pressfield, uh, he's the author of many books, a lot of books, um, both nonfiction and fiction. Uh, his debut novel, The Legend of Bagger Vance, uh, was adopted for screen, so uh, turned into a film of the same title released in, in uh, 2000, directed by Robert Redford with Matt Damon and Will Smith. Um, he's written a bunch of books you've probably heard of, including his books around his struggles to earn a living as a writer. Um, it took him 17 years to get to his first paycheck, which we'll talk about. And he's detailed that in the, in the War of Art, Turning Pro, The Authentic Swing, Nobody Wants to Read Your Beep, and The Knowledge. Uh, and uh, so just, uh, just a prolific writer. Uh, his book, The War of Art, was crazy impactful for me as I was getting started on my journey uh, for, for book writing and all that good stuff. So today what we're going to be talking about is the war of art, turning pro as a writer and, and as an author. What's the, diff the difference between fiction and nonfiction writing as he sees it and a whole lot more. Stephen, great to have you. All right. It's great to be here, Chandler. Thanks for having me. So wh why did you decide to be become a writer? And why books? I mean, they've obviously become such a huge part of your life, but what, what was the impetus behind the start? Um, when I was, uh, I don't know, maybe 22 or 23, I worked as a junior copywriter at a big ad agency in New York. And I had a boss named Ed Hannibal. And uh, he wrote a novel out of the blue and it became an instant hit. And he became like overnight a famous guy. <laughs> he quit and he was a full-time writer. And so I thought, well, why the hell don't I do that? It looks pretty easy. So, so I quit too. And, uh, you know, I always say I too became an overnight success. It just took me 30 years after that. <laughs> but I, you know, seriously, in all seriousness, I didn't, I wasn't one of those kids that grew up like writing short stories for English class or anything like that. It never even occurred to me to write anything until I was, you know, a copywriter. And then I saw all of these other people, playwrights and stuff at the, mm. at, that, that were getting things done. And I just thought, wow, this seems pretty cool. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so th that was, that was my impetus for it. Yeah. And so do you think, do you think, like, are there skill sets that you feel like you learned being a copywriter at an ad agency that have translated to not only writing better books, but, 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 writing book descriptions and like writing things that actually lead to selling more books? Um, yes, definitely. Although not, not, you know, I was never a very good advertising writer, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but one thing that they really teach you in advertising, um, like a, a TV commercial, if it's 30 seconds long, can't have more than 60 words of mm. copy, right. Or of dialogue or whatever it is. So, and I found like any other young copywriter that I would write these things that would have like 190 words, you know, and I'd have to like bring it into my boss and he'd say, cut this, cut it in half. And he'd send me back, you know, I'd take me all day and then I'd bring it back and he'd say, cut this in half, you know, and doing that sort of over and over and over. One thing, if you read The War of Art or Turning Pro or any of those books of mine about writing, you'll see that there's there no wor wasted words in there. You know, it's all very lean. And, and that definitely came out of that experience of just how little, mm. you know, how, how short can you make it and yeah. still communicate the idea? Yeah. I mean, it's the classic, uh, I don't know if it's misattributed or not, but a Abe Lincoln quote of if I would have had a longer, I would have written a shorter letter. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's the, uh, um, gosh, uh, Jerry Seinfeld who said, hey, I'll spend an hour cutting one word out of a joke. Because ah, it, 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 so I never I like heard that. That's great. I believe that completely. Yeah. Yeah. So obviously you've, you've now written in, in multiple genres. And if I'm, if I've, if my research is correct, um, I believe that you wrote fiction first, then nonfiction. Uh, I've, yes. So what would be your advice for multi-genre authors on which genre they should start with first? If, if, if someone's like, Hey, I've got a nonfiction idea and a fiction idea. Which one should I write first? Uh, I really think it varies with who the person is and what what their natural strength is. Mm -hmm. You know, um, yeah, this, I I couldn't say one or the other. For yeah. me, I was just uh, uh, I just always wanted to tell stories. 
rather than write essays or do biographies or anything like that. So fiction worked for me, but I would say to anybody thinking about that, whatever your heart tells you is, mm. is the way to go. Mm -hmm. And how did you, I, I mean, the, I, was it just the desire to tell stories or how did you land on fiction first? Because I, I, uh, it seems like you had a background in screenplays and, and so there, or, or you worked on screenplays at the start and then first fiction book, then movie. Is that kind of the timeline? Um, not exactly, but close. Okay. Like I okay. first, I, I, you know, like my boss in advertising that wrote a novel, mm -hmm. I thought, well, I want to write a novel too. You know, that seemed like the cool thing. To, so that's <laughs> how I started. And I wrote over a period of, I don't know, maybe 12 or 15 years, I wrote like three novels that never got published. You know, they were just the kind that you should stick in a drawer, you know? So, and finally, I, I just kind of gave up on that. I just said, I'm never going to be able to do that. And, uh, and I, uh, I went out to Hollywood from New York and tried to, you know, to become a screenwriter. And I had like a kind of a B or C level career for about 10 years as a screenwriter. But that really sort of got me very much into storytelling, you know, mm. and what is a story and what is mm. act one, act two, all the stuff that, that mm. you learn. Yeah. And then finally, I, I had the idea for The Legend of Bagger Vance as a, as a novel. Mm -hmm. And finally, I was able to do that. And that mm -hmm. sort of, you know, broke, broke through for me in that sense. What did you learn in your time as a screenwriter that, that you feel like made you a better writer? I mean, I could talk about this for, for years, you know, for uh, really for hours. Yeah. Um, you know, there, uh, there is a sort of a, a model of what a screenplay is, you know? Um, and if you, if you put almost any movie up against this model, have you ever read anything by Blake Snyder, Save the Cat? Does that ring a bell at all? I mean, no. He's like a kind of a screenwriting teacher and a screenwriter. He died, unfortunately, at a young age. But he, he's a great guy that breaks out this kind of model. Like a screenplay is always in three acts. You know, the first act is like maybe 27 pages. The middle is maybe 54 pages. Act three is another 20-something pages. And there are definite beats that go along the way an inciting incident, a crossing of the threshold, an act to midpoint, you know, an all is lost moment, bump it a bump it a bump, right? And whether you put up Casablanca or, uh, you know, uh, The Wizard of Oz or Star Wars, they all kind of follow a real similar sort of template. And as you work in the business, you learn that, you know, it just gets beaten into your head, you know? And so that... Uh, that model I have found also works for novels. I mean, you can also do it many, many other ways as well. But uh, so you do sort of learn what a story is. The idea of the hero's journey, that whole concept, you know, that, uh, you know, going from A to Z. And um, so that, that's kind of, yeah. it's, it's like uh, the University of Hard Knocks in, yeah. in the movie business. And so you're, so it sounds like a big takeaway is over, you know, five part story structure and like overall story structure and, you know, slap and citing incident, kind of all that stuff. Yeah. What were some other, like, what were maybe some more nuanced things that you feel like you learned? I, I would imagine there, what's the, I mean, you're condensed to an hour and a half or two hours. So did that, and, and it's, you know, dialogue, I guess, or, you know, you're writing for a movie versus writing for a book. Was there any other kind of like nuance? Oh, yeah. I mean, well, I, I mean, know like you said you talk about this for days. There's so much. <laughs> yeah. But one thing, of course, is, is in a movie or screenplay, let's say, you really mm -hmm. can't go inside a character's head. You can't do an interior monologue unless uh... you do it in like a voiceover, which is always really lame, you know? Um, so you have to rely on, or you learn to say on that, the only way you can kind of communicate what the character is feeling is by visual you know, what's in their face, what's in their, what, what they act and whatever dialogue they say. And that's a great discipline. Um, so um, it really forces you to tell a story in the leanest way possible. And the other thing, I mean, like I said, I could talk about this forever, but there's a concept in dialogue writing for movies called On the Nose. Have you, have you heard that one, Chandler? Mm -hmm. Like writing on the nose is a big no-no, never supposed to. And what that means is when an actor or a character 
says in their dialogue out loud what they're thinking. In other words, it's text instead of subtext. And it's uh, always much better, if, particularly if the character is saying the opposite of what they're thinking. Like one character is across from another and has a gun in his pocket and is intending to kill that other person, right? Mm -hmm. But what the character may talk about is how much they love them, how interesting they, they are, you know, all the great friendship that they have. And the reason that's you want to write like that in movies is because the audience watching that sees the body language, sees the look in the eye and says, oh, wait a minute, this guy's going to kill this other character, yeah. you know? And that's more fun than if the character went in and said, I'm going to blow your brains out, <laughs> you know, you SOB. So that's a, a whole other way that you learn to write dialogue for movies. Mm. It should never be on the nose. It should always be subtext instead of text. Hmm. And so are you, are, are you saying that that's frowned upon in, in movies, but you would do that differently in books or you would do it the same way? In it it way? is a little different in books. It's harder in books because you don't have, you can't see the character's face. You can't see the character's body language, right? So it is harder, but anytime you can do it. I mean, I'll just give you one small example. There's, uh, if you remember the movie Fight Club, you know, with Brad Pitt and... Uh, uh, I'm blanking on the other guy's name, um, Edward Norton. Edward And Edward Norton throughout the course of the movie has a sort of an on again love thing going with, um, I'm blanking on her name too, but there's a scene at the end of the movie where he puts her on a bus to save her and she looks back at him across the bus and says to him, you're the worst thing that's ever happened to me in my life. And what she really means by that is, I love you. And so that is a, that is a case of subtext instead of text. Ah. And it's really powerful because mm -hmm. he's saving her life, putting her on the bus like Humphrey Bogart, putting Ingrid Bergman on the plane to Lisbon in Casablanca. And uh, so that's great screenwriting. Yeah, that's interesting, interesting nuance. So as someone who's now written... Uh, you know, you've Helena Bonham Carter. That's the name. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> nice. As, as someone who's now written uh, fiction and nonfiction, obviously been very, very prolific in both. How do you approach uh, those uh, writing each type of book differently? Like, how is a how is your approach to writing great nonfiction different from your approach uh, to writing? Uh, 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 great fiction? Of course, nonfiction covers a real wide range of, of stuff, right? It could be a biography of Harry Truman. You know, that would be nonfiction, or it could be a self-help book, or it could be something um, like uh, The Tipping Point or Outliers, a Malcolm Gladwell type of book that would be like a big think piece. Or, you know, so it's quite a lot of different stuff. And, and he, Eat. The big issue, I think, and well, there's a lot of issues, but one big issue is what is the what is the narrative voice in both cases? Like um, in uh, um, in uh, To Kill a Mockingbird, let's say, a, a novel, fiction. The narrative voice is the story is told by the young girl Scout, the daughter Atticus Finch's daughter Scout, and it's told not as a little girl but in memory, as a grown woman, in memory, describing what happened one summer when she was, whatever, eight or nine years old. And so once you, the writer, have settled on that narrative voice, then everything kind of falls into place, right? Scout has a voice. She feels a certain way about her brother, you know, Jim, about, uh, about her dad, Atticus, et cetera, et cetera. Now, on the other hand, if you're Malcolm Gladwell, and you're writing outliers or something like that, you kind of have to ask yourself, well, what, what voice do I want to use? Do I want to be like an authoritative, all-knowing, wise person who's going to spell something out to you? Or do I want to be kind of your friend that's kind of telling you, gee, I got interested in this idea about the tipping point, and I happen to be in Baltimore, and I was talking to a lady, but that sort of stuff, right? So uh, finding that narrative voice you know, who's telling the story and, and what tone of voice are you going to use to the reader? Mm -hmm. um, for instance, in, in my book, The War of Art, I sort of speak in my own voice. 
So it's Steve Pressfield addressing you, the reader. But it's not really me. It's not like if you and I were hanging out in a bar, and I was who, whatever I was, I, I, I have a, sort of adopted a certain kind of voice. And, um, and that took a lot of thought, you know, to figure out, am I going to be buddy, buddy with the reader? Or am I going to be a little bit of a drill sergeant and kind of kick the reader in the ass a little bit, you know? Yeah. Or am I going to be um, self, self-revealing and tell yeah. stories about my own failures? Mm. Um, and that, which is a lot of that is, is in the war of art. Yeah. So each one, I think the fiction or nonfiction, a lot of it is about finding that, that tone of voice, that narrative um, medium. Hmm. And so let's break that down a little bit, one genre at a time. So with your nonfiction books, how do you decide on the voice? And is that voice consistent across all books? Are you saying, okay, this is the tone that I feel like I need to be in for this specific message in this specific book? That's a great question. Great. I think it's different with each book, depending on the book sort of, the book will determine what it is. You know, if you were writing a biography of the Dalai Lama, you probably wouldn't use a joking tone of voice, right? It would probably be a respectful tone of voice, right? Um, on the other hand, if you were uh, writing, you know, Bill Murray's life story, it might be a kind of a zany thing. You might even come up with, you might not even have chapters. You might have like little snippets, <laughs> right? You know? Yeah. Um, so it, it, the, the sort of the tone of voice and the, sort of arises from the material. Mm, yeah. And and would you say that's the same on the fiction side of th things? Like, do you- Definitely. Okay, got it. Definitely. How do like, you decide um, there? Uh, well, let's see. Uh, you know, um, like, let's say Catcher in the Rye. It's a book we're all kind of familiar with. It's really, it's told in a really, by the narrator, Holden Caulfield, in the first person, in the first person, and it starts, I remember the beginning goes something like this. If you really want to know about it, you probably want to hear about my lousy life and how I was raised by my parents uh, and it was really terrible. But, you know, I'm tired of that stuff. So let me just tell you the truth. Right. So that's a real kind of offhand, really. Um, what's the word? Uh, uh, it really brings the reader in right away, you know, and you know that it's not yeah. going to be some formal high tone thing, but that's very much a crafted voice, mm. very much a decision on J.D. Salinger's part to write it that way. He mm. probably doesn't talk that way, you know, um, and, and if you go to, uh, you know, any, any book will have a different, if, if you read like all of Philip Roth's books, Although they're very similar, he'll have a different tone of voice in each one, depending on, and, and that takes a lot of thought. Um, who tells the story? Is it, uh, is it the all-seeing author? Is it one character? Is it a different character? But it seems to me, from my experience, if you get that right yeah. at the start, mm. everything is easy. <laughs> yeah, if you I'm get it saying. wrong, you torture yourself. <laughs> That's got to be the, the million dollar question. Have you ever gotten into a book and, and been part of the way through and said, oh man, I, cho I just chose wrong and now I've got to go back to yes. redo this? Exactly. Yes, yes. But usually it's very clear. It's not like you get in 90 pages in. It's like you get in there two pages and you know, eh, this is uh, not working at all, you know? Got it. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. So I want to I want to touch on this piece because, you know, it, it, it took you 17 years to, to earn a paycheck um, from your writing. And I think, uh, it, it, and I think it's probably, gosh, this is good. I feel like this is going to relate to so many people where you see someone close to you become an overnight success. And then it's like, you, you, you know, you, for me, it was dropping out of school and pursuing my company. And it sounds like for you, it was like, all right, I quit my job and I'm going to do this. And then 17 years, what did you learn from that? <laughs> And, and, and how did you last? I mean, I feel like so many people would just give up. So how, how, how'd you last and what did you learn from that that would be helpful for other authors that are kind of on that journey? Well, that's another great question. And what I definitely learned was when, when you struggle for so long with no um, 
no financial reward, no anything. You, you have to ask yourself, why am I doing this? You know, <laughs> am I crazy? Yeah. Is there something yeah. wrong? I'm serious now, you know, is there something wrong with me? Am I demented? Am I just self-destructive? You know, and, uh, and I just sort of came to the conclusion that this is who I am. I'm a writer and I'm going to keep doing this and I don't care. You know, if it takes me forever, I never break through. I'm going to keep doing it. So that, that, uh, that was a, uh, that was a really big breakthrough, you know, in the sense of, okay, I'm just going to, you know, like um, Elizabeth Gilbert says, you know, the author of Eat, Pray, Love and other books. She said at the start of her career, she kind of made a deal with her writing. And she said, I will never ask you to support me. I will always support you. You know, mm. if I have to work as a waitress, mm. I'll work as a waitress to to do my writing. And I think that was a mm. that was a great thing on her part, you know. Mm. Um, now, the second part of your question, Chandler, was like, how did I keep going? Yeah. And uh, the the answer is that uh, many times I tried to not keep going. You know? <laughs> I tried you know, I went back to work in advertising. I worked in other kind of jobs and I really were, I really tried. I said, let me just try to succeed, but I couldn't. I was just so depressed at the end of a day that I would have to go home and try to write something. That's one part of that period. But the other part of it is like, when I started working as a screenwriter and I actually, it wasn't what I really wanted to do, but I was learning. I was working in my chosen field. I was getting a paycheck, you know, and I was learning each. So that kept me going. I felt, you know, you feel like, ah, the next one's going to be the one, you know? Yeah. Um, so, uh, so those various things kind of kept me going. Yeah. That's the, and so getting closer to what you, you want to do, and maybe it's not all the way there, but it's like maybe for a aspiring author, it might be, a, a similar thing could be freelancing. Like I'm yeah. freelance writing for someone else and it's not exactly what I want to do, but it's helping me get better at my craft and I'm getting a paycheck, which helps me yes. feel like a little bit more momentum. Yes. And yeah. another thing that I did in that period of, for a while, I had a little freelance advertising business, just me, a one man thing. And what I was doing, what I was writing wasn't helping me at all, but I felt like I can support myself, you know, I can, mm -hmm. I, in an entrepreneurial way, it was a real low level thing. I was just like making barely enough to pay my rent, but yeah. at least I felt like, you know, I'm, I'm learning to be an entrepreneur. I'm yeah. learning not to rely on a paycheck from a company. Mm -hmm. I'm learning to, you know, and I learned, one of the things I learned in that period was that you don't even have to be good. All you have to do is be reliable. <laughs> All you have to do, seriously, yeah. you know, because your competition are so flaky and yeah. so unreliable that if you just show up, even if you're producing mediocre work, people mm -hmm. love you. They're so happy to see you that you're there, you know, to actually do a job and deliver it on time. So that reinforces you in, in being a professional. And then when you start actually writing movies or writing books, you know, you deliver on time. Yeah. And that helps a lot. Yeah. What would be your advice for folks, you know, that from that 17 year period, knowing what you know now on how to condense that time period? Um, <laughs> you know, I don't know if you can condense it. Yeah. I mean, I think things happen in their own time, you know, yeah. throughout, I mean, through a lot of that period, I wasn't writing at all. I was, mm. I was doing other stuff, but it, I would say realistically, before I was able to produce something that was publishable was probably about 20 years. And the stuff that I did, some of it wasn't bad, but it wasn't at the level of being publishable. And I myself wouldn't have published it if I was, if I was a publisher. So for me, it took a long time to kind of just get to the point where I could actually write something that was worthwhile. And it isn't easy. Why does what people think, you know, everybody thinks they can write just yeah. like I did at the start when my boss mm -hmm. wrote this novel, I thought, well, shit, I'll write a novel, you know, and I was an idiot, you know, <laughs> and anybody that watched me would have said, buddy, you think you don't know nothing, yeah. you know? Yeah. yeah. 
Hmm. So, so you feel like there's no way to condense the process. I mean, I think for some people it happens right away, right? God hmm. bless them. They're lucky. You know, a lot of people, I look at Bob Dylan or Neil Young or Joni Mitchell, you know, when they were like 18 years old, they were having gigantic hits, hmm. you know, God bless them that they got lucky, you know? For me, I was like 54 years old before I sold a novel. So mm. some people, some of us takes a little longer. Hey, well, um, uh, good news for anyone listening. It's not too late. <laughs> it's <laughs> not think, too late. Yeah, if you think you missed it. Hey, let's talk about, I mean, this is a through line. And and I mean, in your book, uh, the, the War of Art, and it, it, you talk about resistance. And, and it's, and it's just, I, I just remember listening to the audio book and it was like resistance, resistance, resistance. Uh, for those are, who are unfamiliar with the concept, what is it and how can writers fight through resistance to get their first book written? Ah. Uh, well, one of the, the earliest sentences in The War of Art goes something like this. It said, there's a secret that real writers know that wannabe writers don't know. And the secret is this, it's not the writing part that's hard. What's hard is sitting down to write. And what, mm. what stops us from sitting down is what I call resistance with a capital R. And resistance is that force, like if you sit down before one of these things and there's a blank screen in front of you, you can feel radiating off that screen into your face, a negative force, right? That is trying to get you to go have a hot fudge Sunday or head for the beach or take a nap or you know, do anything but actually do your work, right? And that force is what I call resistance. It's the force of, of self-sabotage, of self-doubt, of fear, of everything that will stop you from doing your thing. And that's why there are millions and millions of people who want to be writers, but very, very few that actually are writers mm. or anything, songwriters, musicians, you know, whatever. And that force of, of self-sabotage and of self-undermining, self-doubt is the primary devil. It's really not that hard to write. You can learn how to write. But to overcome your uh -huh. own resistance, your own internal force of self-sabotage, that takes guts. Hmm. And, and the other thing is that, at least for me, I never even knew that there was such a thing as resistance. I thought that voice in my head was real. The voice telling me, you're a loser, you're a bum, how dare you think that you can write this thing? It's all been done before, you're, you know, your stuff sucks, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and finally, one day, I just sort of said, that's not me, that's not my voice, mm. that's this negative force that's mm. out there. And that mm -hmm. gave me the ability to sort of dismiss it. When I'd hear that voice, I would just say, ah, get out of here, you know, I'm still yeah. going to do my work. I don't believe that voice. I don't accept it. I dismiss it. Hmm. Um, but that's the real challenge. That's really what kind of separates the professionals from the amateurs, right. from people who are going to succeed, from people that are going to fail, hmm. is knowing that, uh, that there is this force called resistance and that you, the writer or the would-be artist, have to marshal all your resources, all your guts, all your courage, all your perseverance, all your self-belief to overcome that force. Hmm. But once you do that, then, you know, you're, you're in the game. Hmm. And so I, I love the, the externalizing it as, as this identity that is not me. It's this external thing, which makes it easier to dismiss it. Any other thoughts for, for writers on, uh, I know, obviously you talk about this in the book, but, but practical ways to, to, to kind of shed resistance specifically in the, in the book writing process. I mean, each, each person, I think, will come up with their own way of doing it. You know, some like to tackle it head on, like I do. That's, that works for me. Others kind of do a little sort of a jujitsu thing, you know, they kind of will, will give it a name and they'll tell it to go in the corner, you know, or something like that. Um, but I think the, the main thing is, is to take it seriously and, and to treat it with respect. It's a real enemy. 
it's 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 a it's the demon you know it's a devil and mm. finding a way to do it i mean one of the things that my, my follow-up book to the war of art as you know is a book called turning pro mm -hmm. and that sort of was my way of of getting around resistance of thinking of myself not as an amateur not an amateur writer not a wannabe writer but as a professional because a professional has a whole different attitude than an amateur you know an amateur when he or she hits adversity an amateur folds you know an amateur will write or will do a creative thing mm. depending on their mood it's like they wake oh do i feel like it you know well maybe i don't really feel like it today <laughs> but a pro doesn't care what they feel like yeah. they're going to sit down and, and do their work and and a pro sort of learns that sometimes the days when you least feel like it are the best days Woo. you get the best work so and other things that a pro a pro shows up every day mm -hmm. right? i always think of like michael jordan or kobe bryant you know or tom brady somebody like that you know i don't care what they feel like in the morning they show up right and the pro stays on the job all day you know a pro is in it for real they're not dabbling they're not screwing around they're not doing it superficially they're committed you know and a pro plays hurt this is another big part of the thing mm. if you think about michael jordan or kobe bryant or any any great athlete you know they all know that you're never 100 percent when you get on the floor right your ankle is tweaked your elbow doesn't work your finger is broken you know you've got a migraine whatever and a pro uh, an amateur will fold an amateur will say i can't do it i'm i'm, I'm all screwed you know but a pro Michael Jordan would never even dream of folding, right? Yeah. He would, you know, have a broken leg with a bone would be coming out of his flesh and he'd still be playing. So, so that's the, that kind of an attitude, a really a serious professional attitude, turning pro. The other thing about turning pro is you can, it, you can do it just by flipping a switch in your mind. It doesn't cost any money. You don't have to take a course. You just decide I'm not an amateur anymore and I'm not going to do this as an amateur. I'm going to, I'm going to be, I'm a pro. Mm. And then it's a process of reinforcing that every day mm. and telling yourself whether you have to use affirmations, look yeah. in the mirror, whatever, you know, I'm a, I'm a pro. I'm not an amateur. I'm not going to fold. I'm not going to cave. Yeah. No matter how I feel, I'm going to do my work. Yeah. That's so great. And, and, and you alluded to this, and I'm, I'm pretty sure it's your book. Um, it's, it's always stuck with me. If it isn't, I'll take credit for it. I think you talk about it's the, uh, the I think it's Somerset uh, Magnum or something oh, like that. Somerset Mom, yeah. Gets asked, yeah. Do, do you write when you're inspired or do you write every day on a schedule? And it's like, oh, well, of course, it's only when I'm inspired. Uh, but fortunate for me, that's at 9 a.m. every single morning. Yeah. Right. And so just that that concept of being a pro and pros have a schedule. They show up. They do the work, whether they feel like it or not. That's so great. Exactly. Hey, so can you so we, we talked on resistance specific to writing and I pulled I pulled some of our audience before this interview and said, hey, what are some questions you want me to ask? And one of them, one of my thought was really interesting. It was resistance specific to publishing. So it's our, I've already, and she was like, oh, I have this resistance and, or like, I, you know, I work through it. I write the book. It's all good. But then for me, the resistance hits right before I publish it. And, and so any thoughts on that? Have you been through that? And any, any thoughts for folks um, on how to work through that? Do you mean like self-publishing? Yeah. It, I mean, it could be self-publishing or traditional publishing, but ah. like the actual crossing over from the manuscripts done to I am putting this out in the world. Yeah. That's a great question. Cause it's absolutely true. That is a huge point of resistance. Um, you know, there are kind of predictable points in, in, the, in, a, in any project. I don't care what it is, building a city, starting your own restaurant, starting a, that are resistance points. And one of them is before you even begin. Resistance will be very strong trying to get trying to get you to just to, to uh, not even start right you can't do it forget it. Then there's a you usually plunge in and to your amazement you're actually working 
And then you get, you're real enthusiastic. You know, you, you get, you know, maybe the first act of something done. And then all of a sudden you sort of wake up, you're sort of like somebody that was water skiing for the first time and they're actually up and skiing. And then suddenly they look down, oh my God, I'm actually up, you know? And then you panic. And then you, that's when resistance hits again. <laughs> then in the middle, resistance will hit because you're like, you're too far from the beginning to be psyched up by that. And you're too far from the end to, to that's a big point in the middle. Then right before the end, just when you're on the one yard line, that was for me, the big resistance point for me. I would fold and you know, 99% of the way through. But then you're absolutely right. At the moment when you're ready to publish is another huge, huge resistance point. Like, you know who Seth Godin is, right? Mm -hmm. He has a thing called shipping. And what he means by that is like, if you're Steve Jobs and you just invented the iPhone and it's ready to go, it's like, when do you push the button and say, ship it, you know, get it out there among. And of course, that's a really scary moment because then you're, you can be judged, right? The thing can fail as long as you've got it still in the box and you haven't shipped it. So Seth has a whole big thing about psyching people up to ship. And so, yes, it is a huge resistance point and you just have to suck it up and do it. You know, <laughs> that's awesome. Well, hey, um, a couple of final questions I have for you. Um, one would be, and so I was I was interviewing um, John C. Maxwell last week, and I asked I asked him this same question. And I'm curious to get your take. Um, so you're in your 70s. How do you keep the passion to 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 like to keep doing this as you get older? And any advice for others who uh, they're probably in one or two buckets. Either they're thinking like you know you said hey, I didn't publish my first work till 54, so maybe they're even in their 50s thinking hey I've already missed it. Or they're they're in their 50s, 60s, 70s, trying to find that fire. How how do you do it? Um, you know, maybe it was for me that it it took me so long to get started mm. that I or to get any bit of success that I sort of feel like I'm still behind the eight ball. You know, I'm way. You know, I'm I, I'm I'm just I, I've got I, I still haven't completed anything, but also. I don't have any problem with that. I still have ideas. I'm still enthusiastic. I still have things I, I want to do. I'm, I'm like, a, you know, people talk about burnout. And I think that you burn out if you're in a, a, an endeavor that's really not your passion. If it is your passion, I don't think you ever burn out. I mean, the Rolling Stones are still performing, you know. I mean, we just lost uh, one of their guys, you know, but... The, the Stones are still out there performing at whatever they are, 79 years old, as whatever Mick Jagger is. Um, so, uh, yeah, no, I don't, I don't have any problem with that at all. I wish I could do more. Yeah. Wow. This is a, this is a big question, but I'm just super curious. I don't know if I have time to get into it, um, but I know we get asked about this all the time. Um, we have kind of our nonfiction division of the company, children's book side of the company and our fiction side of the company. And I know, I mean, it's every fiction author's uh, dream to get their book turned into a movie. So obviously, you know, you had the screenplay background. Any tips for folks on how, how, how to take that leap from book to movie? Uh, a lot of it is yeah, tips. If I had any tips, I'd have more movies. But, uh... <laughs> I will say one thing, um, writing a novel is a great way to get a movie made rather than trying to write a screenplay mm. because particularly in, the, in today's environment, you, when I first came out to Hollywood in like in the mid eighties and early nineties, it was a different world. And what they call spec scripts, scripts written on speculation, you know, with, without a buyer could actually get made. And, and studios were looking for them and actors were looking for them, but that's not the case anymore. Now that there are so many, other than in the independent film world, now there's so many sequels and so many Marvel comics thing. And those go only to like big established writers that the studios know can deliver, you know? So, but to write a book and then hopefully the book gets picked up by someone, that is a good way to get to get uh, uh, to get to get a story made right now is a bad time because of COVID. Yeah, that pre-COVID, 
when every, the studios got scared and they began stockpiling material. Mm -hmm. So they now are sitting on, you know, a bunch of scripts and mm -hmm. they're not looking for any, anything new. Yeah. But um, a lot of it is just luck. There's just no, you know, if you have a good agent and can get something out, but a lot of it is just luck finding right, people, you know, the, somebody finds you and, and that's about the only way you can do it. I haven't figured out how to get it done. I keep watching stuff that's being made. And I say, why are they making that instead of my stuff? My stuff's much better than that. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, man. It, it's hard. It's, yeah. a re it's a real, real long shot. Yeah. That's, um, well, Stephen, this has been so great. What, what would be, what would be your parting piece of advice for kind of, so for the, for the Stephen Pressfield of a bajillion books ago. So before you even wrote your first book and all the other uh, Stephen Pressfields out there that are sitting there contemplating um, writing their, their first book, what would be your advice for those folks knowing what you know now? Um, okay, I'll, I will give you, I will put out some advice. You know, if you wanted to be a concert pianist or a brain surgeon, you would know in your mind, I got to put in 12 years of back-breaking work, right? I got to be absolutely committed. But people seem to think, oh, you're just like I did. Oh, I could write a novel. No problem. You know, it's hard work. Why would writing a novel be easier than brain surgery? It's not. At least brain surgery you can go to school for, right? You can actually get a degree and now you're a brain surgeon. So I would say, but the good news is you can get better. You can start out as a kind of a bum, like I did. And little by little by little, you can get better. You can learn. You can make mistakes and learn from it. And I've sort of have a, just from observing uh, other people and myself trying to pursue a career, I figure like, if, if you can hang in, this is in any creative field, like uh, for music, to be a band, to be a songwriter, to be whatever, or, or movies or books. If you can hang in for 10 years, and, and, and pay your dues, meet people, learn, learn your craft. Most people, I think, you know, after 10 years, we'll find a way, you know, maybe you're not going to write Gone with the Wind, but, you know, you, you can, you can find a career in the field one mm -hmm. way or another. Might not be the career mm -hmm. you started out wanting to do, mm -hmm. but it, but it could be something. So, yeah. but it ain't easy. And if you think it's easy, you're just kidding yourself. Um, it's easy for some people. Bob Dylan did it, you know, Neil Young did it. But for most people, you got to pay your dues. Yeah, that's good. I had a mentor one time, he said, Chandler, it takes 10 years of coming overnight success. Yeah. And yeah. It's kind of like you said, it's true. Absolutely. For overnight yeah. Success. Yeah. Yeah. For me, it was 30 years. <laughs> so be of good, be of good cheer. Oh man, well, this has been so great. Where can people go uh, to find out, you know, to find your books, to buy your books, to find out more about you and what you're up to? Um, I have a website, stephenpressfield.com. I'm on Instagram, Stephen underscore Pressfield. Amazon, any of those places have all my stuff. Um, yeah, just Google me and you'll find, uh, uh, you know, plenty of stuff. Awesome. Well, guys, um, check out his books. And especially, I mean, I've, I mentioned this at the top, but just the War of Art had such a huge impact on me and is just just so helpful along my journey. So uh, if you want, if you're going to start with one, that's a good one to start with. At least that's a personal recommendation from you. Stephen Pressfield. Thank you, sir. Chandler Bowl. Thank you for having me. And uh, if you ever want to do this again, we'll, I'm happy to do it again. Yes, sir. All right. My best to Jeremy. <laughs>